Thank you, Dr. Walker, and um, all of you for, again, sticking it out. I want this to be of value to you, so please feel free to interrupt me with questions um, during the presentation because, again, it's, you know, I, I don't want to be here and just talk at you. I want you guys to tell me what you're most interested in or what you have questions about because this talk should be valuable to you. Okay. Let's see. I'm just going to test this out here. Okay. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, all of the NCCN palliative care guidelines that I'm mentioning in my talk are recommendation category 2A. Uh, so they're based upon lower level evidence, uniform NCCN consensus um, that the interventions are appropriate. So this is interesting timing. Hot off the press, in August of 2017, in the latest issue of JNCCN, um, they released the Palliative Care version 2.2017 updated guidelines. So what did they focus on? So there's a, a really nice um, summary article in that issue. Uh, it's available online and also available in, is the full and most current version that you can find at nccn.org. It's quite long, <laughs> so I really just want to focus on a couple of things here to help you guys with um, under, understanding and appreciating the update and what they focused on. So I think a good place to start is just what is palliative care, right? So you can see that there's this NCCN guideline version definition because they start off with it as well um, pretty early on. So palliative care, and I, I don't want to completely read this, but they're saying it's a, a special kind of patient and family-centered care. So that's oftentimes what we mentioned, very key. Let me just see, is this a pointer? <laughs> no. Do you know? Oh. Um, so again, patient and family-centered care and very symptom-focused, right? So a lot of the times we focus on symptoms like pain, difficulty breathing, um, and we recognize in palliative care, and I'm sure you, as you do in oncology as well, that symptoms are um, very multimodal, very multifactorial. There's a lot that feeds into something such as pain, um, so we like to think of complete or whole pain, and a lot of psychosocial and spiritual existential distress can feed into pain. Um, so that's something that palliative care likes to address as well. Um, values, beliefs, and cultures. Um, the goal of palliative care is to anticipate, prevent, and reduce suffering. So really focusing on quality of life for both patients and their families and caregivers, regardless of the stage of the disease or the need for other therapies. So we like to think of palliative care beginning at diagnosis and then de being delivered concurrently, like Dr. Walker mentioned. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of talk about what we think of palliative care from the provider, from the palliative care provider perspective. So above is the old concept, and the uh, x-axis is time, and the y-axis is treatment. So you can see the top model where patient receives diagnosis, and we pursue curative treatment, or treatment with curative intent, and then at some point we decide that our curative intent treatment is either not working or the patient switches over to a more terminal type of illness and then palliative care gets involved uh, until the time of death. The model that we like to think about and a more current model, I would say, is the bottom uh, image where you again have time along the x-axis and treatment along the y-axis and what you see is that over time, um, palliative care is involved at the beginning, um, but our role is more limited, and the disease-modifying or potentially curative treatment, again, as you progress along with t over time, if you see that the treatment is not moving towards cure or remission, palliative care um, takes a larger and larger role in treatment and in developing um, a treatment plan 
Um, and we, you know, the bereavement process, grief and bereavement occur also over time. Uh, and so at the time of patient's death, you've, in theory, hopefully began some of that grief and bereavement work, and it continues even after the patient death. So care continues for the um, patient's family even after death. Okay. So what is palliative care um, from a palliative care provider perspective? And I would say the reason why I'm kind of bringing this up is because um, the NCCN guidelines and the update really focuses on end-of-life treatment. And so palliative care can be provided, again, alongside curative treatment and at any age and any stage. So this is the, the working sort of Center for Advancing Palliative Care definition that the NCC guidelines used and that a lot of us use as well. And again, it really focuses on specialized medical care for folks with serious illness. So you'll notice that end of life and terminal illness is not mentioned in here at all in, in the working definition. Um, and this, actually the wording in this was tested and vetted with a focus group by um, the Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPC. And so there's certain phrases in there that really resonated with um, their test group population, which they pulled from a general um, public population. Uh, and they received good feedback on it, and this um, feedback came from folks who were um, of all religious and cultural backgrounds, so you could be Republican, you could be Democrat, you could be Christian or non-Christian, and it still resonated with, with you. So again, especially trained team of doctors and nurses, other specialists working alongside patients, other, do other doctors or main doctors, it's an extra layer of support. Um, so that's kind of a working definition. How do I explain this to patients, right? How do you explain palliative care to patients? Because this is a, it's a mouthful. Um, and what, you know, what we've kind of tried to do in palliative care is drill down to what are we actually trying to provide? What are we actually trying to do? And what we've sort of come up with um, is goal concordant care. So what is our role? And I say that our role really focuses on trying to figure out what a patient's goals and values are and then to provide medical treatments and care, recommend medical treatments and care that match the patient's or family's goals and values. So goal concordant care. And that's oftentimes how I do introduce it to families, that you know I'm really trying to get to know you guys a little better um, and really trying to figure out what is most important to you so that I can help your team match their medical treatments to what's most important to you. So I'm not trying to go for necessarily comfort-focused care, and I'm not trying to push them towards anything, but really just trying to figure out what's important to you so I can match your treatment to that. So that being said, there are about 5 to 15 percent of our population who are vitalists, right? So those are folks who they really do want you to do, quote, everything. And what really satisfies them is when you do kind of everything, right? Um, and that they see that you have done everything. And we can definitely talk more about what that means and how to manage that, because I think it, it means a lot of different things to different people. Okay. So who developed um, these updates and who helped develop this original guideline? So these are the panel members, uh, and they're made up of both palliative care providers and oncologists from a variety of disciplines and background institutions. The two that I know are Dr. Bach. So Tony Bach is one of our palliative care providers at Harborview. He is also an oncologist at the um, Fred Hutch slash SCCA in Seattle. And he has also developed an app and a program called Vital Talks. So I know that you know, a lot of you might practice in areas where palliative care is not readily available and he recognizes that. And so he holds a number of very specific trainings for providers throughout the year, and particularly for oncologists. This is what he developed, his app and his original program. It was geared towards oncologists. Um, it has expanded to all different um, types of providers from all different types of backgrounds, but really it was developed for you, for oncologists. So I highly recommend checking it out, Vital Talks. He also has an, a free app, Vital Tips. 
Um, and I've met Jennifer Temmel. She came to speak at uh, the University of Washington um, a couple years back. Okay. So what are the new guideline objectives? So again, I focused a lot on what palliative care means and what how we see palliative care as palliative care providers. Um, but the guideline objectives, um, again, really help assure that each patient with cancer experience has the best quality of life. Uh, so you'll hear these things over and over. Uh, and then include recommendations for the screening, assessment, and management of palliative care needs of patients with cancer and their families slash caregivers. So this is what the guidelines are trying to help you achieve. Again, what's new focuses more on end of life, utilizing hospice, transitions to end of life, and end of life concerns. So the update is focused more on when do you transition these folks, how do you transition these folks, how do you assess them and know when to transition these folks. So why is that their focus? So for several reasons, and I think all of you are probably quite familiar with this, um, but several years back, um, the Institute of Medicine released their report, Dying in America, Improving Quality and Honoring Individual Preferences Near the End of Life. And what they found, unfortunately, is that we don't do a really great job of transitioning folks to end of life or meeting their needs at the end of life. Um, a lot of folks still die with a, a pretty significant symptom burden. So um, again, one of the other studies cited in the NCCN guideline updates is this study uh, where about a third of patients with cancer still reported moderate to severe symptoms uh, in the last week of life. And you can see the domains in which they reported them, so pain, nausea, anxiety, depression, shortness of breath, drowsiness, well-being, and loss of appetite and tiredness. So all of the symptoms that um, we often find come along with advanced cancer and with treatment for advanced cancer. And then they found that um, through the Dartmouth Atlas Project, with, which a lot of us are familiar with as well, that there's a severe underutilization of hospice by patients with poor prognosis cancers. And the median length of stay, unfortunately, on hospice is an average of nine days. And most hospice organizations will tell you that that's a little too short for them to really be of any benefit to your patients. Um, because what hospice does is they like to get to know your patients, they like to get to know their families. Again, they're starting to work on the grief and bereavement support. So when their time with the patient, getting to know the patient and the patient's families and caregivers is so limited, um, they can't really do a, a whole lot of really effective work. I'd say the other thing that was not counted in the short length of stay in hospice is those folks who you refer to hospice and they don't even make it to intake, right? So I've definitely had patients who we've referred to hospice at Harborview and they, they die in the ambulance or they die the day of discharge and they don't quite make it to even the intake portion of hospice. Um, so those patients I would say that, you know, we, um, we unfortunately consulted hospice a little too late. Okay. So here are the actual updated guidelines and the updates focus on two areas and I'm sorry the text is so small but I'll summarize it for you. Uh, it starts off on the left with estimated life expectancy and then it you know the algorithm talks about what interventions and um, reassessment so starting on the left you can see that they're talking about life ex expectancy of years years to months and months to weeks that's how we tend to think about prognosis in palliative care as well years years to months 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 to weeks 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 to days so all the way out at years even, they're, they're recommending that you, know, you assess prognostic awareness of the patient and family, provide clear, consistent discussion with the patient and family about prognosis and anticipated care needs, facilitate advanced care planning, um, particularly focusing on making sure they have a surrogate decision maker. And again, um, what I mentioned before that's really important to palliative care providers is getting at values and preferences and goals. Um, and then determine the need for specialized palliative care or eligibility and readiness for hospice care. 
So when you do that assessment, if things seem acceptable, um, which meaning you know um, you notice that the patient or family uh, does not have a high level of distress, that they have an acceptable sense of control over their situation, the caregivers don't feel overly burdened, um, relationships are actually stronger, their quality of life is pretty good, uh, they have a sense of personal growth and enhanced meaning, you're doing really well, so thumbs up, great. Um, the algorithm ends there for that particular assessment. Uh, however, if things are not there and they're unacceptable, then it recommends to intensify palliative care interventions. So what the heck does that mean, right? Um, because I think that that's something that is not completely clear in the guidelines. So what does it mean to intensify palliative care interventions? And I think that's something that Dr. Walker and Dr. Waldron can definitely help try to clarify. But you can see the number of interventions and assessments that they want you to do are pretty significant. And that's really hard to do in the limited time that we have to visit when you're really just trying to take care of your patients with cancer, right? Um, so a lot of these things, are difficult to do, again, in our current medical setting. And it gets worse. So when the life expectancy becomes even more limited, months to weeks, weeks to days, the dying patient, um, your list grows longer. So refer to hospice care agencies, assess patient family understanding of the dying process, um, address potential need for transitions, provide information. Um, and referrals necessary for psychosocial assessment, legacy work, grief counseling, spiritual support, and funeral memorial service planning, um, and it lists a, a bunch of other things to do. So that's a lot of work, and that's a lot to accomplish in a short visit, um, and it's a lot to accomplish as the only provider, right? So, and again, you know, the reassessment um, acceptable is if they feel, you know, you feel that the patient and family aren't overly distressed, again, that they have an acceptable sense of control over their situation, caregivers don't feel too burdened, and their quality of life is, is optimized. But, um, you know, if, if things aren't going that way, again, intensify palliative care interventions. And this is kind of the crux of the guidelines in a lot of ways. So I think What's hard about these guidelines or what's difficult and confusing is how are you supposed to do all of that as a provider? I think that's a lot for any of us to um, bite off and chew on. Um, and a lot of it takes time, and it takes time talking to the patients and families, and it takes time that we're not necessarily reimbursed for, right? If you don't have a palliative care clinic, how do you accomplish all of this? You might have fantastic social workers, you might have fantastic support clinic staff, but how do you do all of this? And so I think that's something that we all have to acknowledge is a real problem with our system currently. And I think, again, these guidelines are wonderful, but how do you actually do all of that? And I think that's something, again, that Dr. Walker and Dr. Waldron will, will help with, but it's, again, it's not something that I think we can all expect will be miraculously solved overnight. But just so that you know, these are what the guidelines are recommending. So early palliative care for patients with metastatic non-small lung, non-small cell lung cancer, I think this is kind of the um, remarkable and surprising article uh, that Dr. Shaw mentioned at the beginning and it's been out since 2010. So what happened, um, it extended uh, survival by a couple of months, and um, folks got early palliative care consults. So they got diagnosed, and then they almost immediately received a palliative care consult. And what Dr. Temmel and her group have been working on since then is trying to figure out what exactly did palliative care do to extend survival, right? Because it's sort of like a black box. They got these early palliative care consults, but what exactly did the palliative care consults do? And I think part of what they did is what the NCCN guidelines update is trying to outline for you, right? And trying to put into objective measures and objective goals. Definitely when I started training, 
and I saw palliative care providers um, working with patients, it seemed like an art, right? It seemed like an art and skill set that you either have or you don't. And now as a palliative care provider, I really do not believe that that's the case. I think that it, it involves education and it involves skills that, that anyone can learn, but we have to know what those are. And so I think the guidelines are out there to help sort of outline what specifically some of the areas of focus for those skill sets might be, but then it's up to us to kind of flesh those out and figure out how do we then um, go about accomplishing that and learning how to, what skills you need to accomplish those things. So the other thing I'll say about the Temel article, which I thought was really fascinating, is when she came to visit us, um, she was asked why, you know, she's, she's an oncologist at MGH, um, what was one of the objectives behind her article? Uh, because they didn't set out to prove that palliative care extended survival, right? But what she did set out to prove um, in her mind was that um, did palliative care decrease survival? So this is really interesting because she was very honest with us, and I don't know if Jody was at this session, but she said, you know, we are all practicing oncology at MGH, and we're fighting for our patients, we're advocating for our patients, we're oncologists, we're doctors, and we all want to extend life if we can and cure, cure our patients. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that you palliative care providers were not killing our patients with your dirty little palliative care hands. <laughs> And so um, I appreciate that honesty, and <laughs> I think she and a number of people were actually surprised, very surprised at the results. Um, and so, you know, when we think about why did palliative care um, lengthen survival, I think for many reasons, because, you know, all of the things that the guidelines mentioned, addressing grief and bereavement, addressing values and goals, a lot of that we think of as chit-chat, right? Because you guys know your patients really well, you probably know their families really well, and all of that you got during your visit and just talking to them. And that's, again, it's not always reimbursable, and we think of it as just like, oh, you know, it's chit-chat, it's small talk, but it's really not. It's actually a lot of work that you're doing already. So what's the big picture? I think you guys are probably already doing an amazing job providing good primary palliative care to your patients. The idea behind palliative care is definitely not to take over care. We really wanna emphasize a collaborative role. So how can we help you provide the best care to your patients at whatever stage, at whatever age, um, in, their, in their journey, in their illness. These guidelines are just that, they're guides. <laughs> and I think palliative care can and should be consulted earlier and more often. I recognize that a lot of you practice in places where you don't have access to palliative care, right? You might have access to hospice, but you might not have access to palliative care. And I think that's a real challenge. And I definitely don't have the answers for that. What I would encourage is, again, for you to um, seek out opportunities to learn a little bit more about palliative care. So what is within that black box of palliative care? Because there are, there are real skill sets, and there are real skills that any of us can learn in order to help advance you know, good quality of life and palliative care and goals and values talks with our patients. Um, and your, your patient does not have to be dying. Palliative care can be provided alongside curative treatment. Um, we, won't, we won't kill your patients with our dirty little palliative care hands. Um, so that being said, I think I'll wrap up uh, a couple minutes early um, and definitely take any questions or we can wait till the panel. <laughs>